Okay, um, so welcome everybody to our third um, event in our Rehabber Club speaker series. Um, today we're going to talk about historic tax credits, um, local, state, and federal. And um, our panelists today are Rachel Retaliata, Valerie. Wow, Valerie, you just said your last name, uh, McGollin. And Ellis Mumford Russell, um, and they're going to give you a little bit of background briefly um, here in just a second before we get started. I did want to go over some quick um, just housekeeping. Um, we're going to take questions at the very end. So if anybody has a question, just go ahead and drop it in the chat. And if you do that, go ahead and um, there's a section where you can put it to everyone. Um, go ahead and do that, please. Um, we can so everybody can see, and then um, my colleague Stephanie is going to help manage those so we can get them talked about um, after the presentation. And um, that is that. And then, um, okay, sorry, I will um, turn it over to um, Rachel. Do you want to go first? Sure thing. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Retaliata. I'm a historic preservation specialist with the Office of Historic Preservation here in San Antonio, and I do coordinate the tax incentive program for the city. And so should you um, should you apply for tax incentives in the future, I will be the case manager for those requests. So we'll go over the local tax incentives that are available uh, today, and then we'll hold questions for the end and we can have a discussion afterward. Um, and then we're also joined by Valerie Magolan. Valerie, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm Valerie Magolan from the Texas Historical Commission, and um, I am part of the tax credit team at the THC. We do only state and federal tax credits all day, every day. Uh, I'm one of the full time project reviewers. Uh, there are three of us, and um, we review all of the state and federal tax credit projects in the state of Texas. And I've been with the agency for uh, going to be seven years now. Um, and we are the state historic preservation office. We're located in Austin. Thank you, Valerie. And we're also joined by Ellis Mumford Russell. Ellis, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ellis Mumford Russell. I am a partner at a firm called Post Oak Preservation Solutions. Um, we're a historic preservation consulting firm, and I'd say about 85 to 90 percent of our work is dealing with state and federal historic tax credit projects. Um, our firm also does design guidelines, national register districts, um, and other general consulting and materials conservation newly. Um, we have offices both in San Antonio and Austin, and we've um, had the pleasure of consulting on a lot of projects in San Antonio. So we'll get through uh, some of the specifics there. Um, I've been working in Texas on historic tax credits going on about six years and uh, moved down here to do that. So looking forward to sharing some more with y'all. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for introducing yourselves and for being here today. And um, this is a part of a larger speaker series for the Rehabber Club, the Historic Home Virtual um, Historic Home Virtual Speaker Series. And so we do have a whole schedule of these talks happening. This is the third one on historic tax credits. And on April 22nd, there will be one on historic paint analysis and colorways. So Katie will talk about that um, more in addition at the end of the talk today. Um, so, first, we're going to start with the local tax incentives that are available here in San Antonio. And uh, so these are incentives for historic rehabilitation. So the local tax incentives that are available are the substantial rehabilitation tax incentive. There is a city fee waiver program that's related to the Office of Historic Preservation and Historic Rehabilitation. And there is also a new historic district tax incentive. And there are also San Antonio Conservation Society grants. So first we'll talk a little bit about the substantial rehabilitation tax incentive. So this is a tax incentive that is for local historic landmarks and also properties that are within a historic district. So properties that are already designated. 
Um, it's for residential and commercial properties. And to be eligible for this tax incentive, um, you would have to spend on a project that's rehabilitating the property an investment of 30% of the current appraised improvement value. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a second. And so this tax incentive is an ad, ad valorem relief of city property taxes. So you have two options if you have a residential property. You, there's a 10-year tax freeze of the pre-rehabilitation assessment value. And there's also the 50550 option where the city tax incentive or the city tax line is frozen for the first five years and for the subsequent five years of the assessment, it's assessed at 50%. So there are two options there for residential properties and for commercial properties, there's the option of the 50550 assessment. So for the substantial rehabilitation tax incentive program, interior and exterior work is eligible. Um, now the Office of Historic Preservation, we only have purview over exterior scopes of work. So you'll apply for certificates of appropriateness for any exterior scopes of work and our office will review and approve those. But for the substantial rehabilitation tax incentive, you can also use interior scopes of work to meet that 30% threshold of the improvement home site value, which will help you qualify for the tax incentive. And the work that's being done most must prolong the useful life of the building. Um, so that could be roof work, foundation work, siding work, um, interior scopes of work, such as electrical, plumbing, HVAC system installation, other structural work, and um, also, like I mentioned, interior work. So if you're rehabilitating the kitchen, the bathrooms, et cetera, all of that work can go towards meeting that 30% threshold. So all of the exterior work that you do has to be um, approved by the Office of Historic Preservation and the Historic and Design Review Commission, if applicable. And the scope of work that you're using to qualify for the incentive must be certified by the Historic and Design Review Commission. So this is the part one application that we recommend you um, submit prior to the start of your work, but you can also submit it later in the project. But we recommend that you submit that prior to the start of work so that you know that your property is eligible for this tax incentive and that you're not banking on that, um, you know, being um, applied to the property later and then finding out later that certain work, sc scopes of work weren't eligible. Um, and then once all the work is completed, your project must be verified by the Historic and Design Review Commission. So that's a part two application process. And so let's dig a little bit more into the eligibility for the Substantial Rehabilitation Tax Incentive Program. So one, the property must be designated historic. So it can either be a historic landmark, um, an individual landmark, or it can be a property that's within an already existing historic district. So the total project costs must, must meet at least 30% of the current appraised improvement value. And so here's what that looks like when you go to uh, bcad.org. That's the website for the Bear County Appraisal District. And when you do the property search for your property, you'll see this within um, the tax assessment. So under values, there's improvement home site value. So the scope of work that you're doing must meet 30% of that figure. So if the improvement home site value for your home is $100,000, then your total rehab cost should be $30,000 to qualify. And so once again, all work must be properly uh, permitted and receive all required certificates of appropriateness through our office. And so we'll talk a little bit more about the application process. So the part one historic tax certification, you'll submit that before or during the project. Um, sometimes people panic a little bit because they don't find out about this program until after their work has been completed or when they're already deep into their project. And that's okay. You can still reach out to our office, submit these applications. Um, these applications are available on our website. When you go to sapreservation.com, which is the Office of Historic Preservation homepage, there's a green box that says application portal. And when you go on to the application portal, the portal there are links for both the part one and the part two um, substantial rehabilitation tax incentive applications. And these are different times. So on the application, it still says that you must submit those applications in person but you'll actually email them to the email address on the application instead. So it's a little more convenient. Um, so when you submit this application, there are required documents. Um, they're listed on the application form. And so that'll be the complete plans for your scope of work. 
um, including drawings and photos, and then a detailed written narrative of your proposed scope of work. And then an itemized list of in expected interior and exterior work, along with a projected time schedule, how long it's going to take you to complete that project, estimated associated costs. So this is how we determine if that project is going to meet the qualification, the eligibility requirements. And then color photos of the interior and exterior. So these will be the before photos of your project, as you can see here on the left. And then color, a color photo of the structure from the street. So you'll submit all of that either before your project begins or during the course of your project. And our staff will take this to the Historic and Design Review Commission for review. And um, that's how you'll determine that this is an eligible project to receive this tax incentive. The part two historic tax verification application is what you'll submit once you've completed the project. And so once you've completed the project, uh, you'll submit this application, including um, pretty much everything you submitted in the part one. Uh, this will just be all of those finalized items. So the detailed written narrative of the completed work, um, the itemized, itemized list of the completed interior and exterior work, the completed time schedule. Um, the itemized list of final associated costs, and then the color photos of the interior and the exterior, which will be the after photos. Um, and then we'll also need the final building inspection clearance. So you'll include in this application all the closed permits, um, the certificate of occupancy, um, and also certificates of appropriateness um, as needed. And so you'll already have all these materials anyway, because if you're doing this work, it will require permitting and any exterior work will require certificates of appropriateness anyway. So it's just about compiling these documents together to submit with the tax applications. So this is a great graphic to kind of show you the timeline of how this process plays out. So in the beginning, you'll determine the scope of work and the cost estimate. You'll submit um, the HDRC application for the exterior work for the um, historic tax certification. And then we'll go to the HDRC hearing. This will be approved by the HDRC. And then you'll complete your project. And following completion, you'll then submit the part two application for historic tax verification. And that's when um, a site visit is required by OHP staff. So I'll come and visit the property. And what I do is I determine that all the work's been complete that you've submitted in your scope of work. And also that everything has been um, properly permitted and approved by our office. So we are not able to um, apply this tax incentive to any property that has an existing violation. So if we determine that that's happened, that some work was missed and you know you didn't apply for a certificate of appropriateness, we'll work with you to make sure that we either reverse that condition or that you get that appropriate approval as needed. Um, so once that site visit is completed, we'll schedule your, uh, your request for a HDRC hearing, the Historic and Design Review Commission hearing. And then once you get that historic tax verification from the HDRC, your tax incentive will then begin the following year of the approval. So if you um, complete this entire timeline within 2021, the tax incentive will be applied to your property in 2022. And a little bit more about the substantial rehabilitation tax incentive. What does that really mean for your property taxes? So, um, like I said, this is applied the year following tax verification. And then the incentive is applied to Entity 21, the City of San Antonio property tax line only. So that's the one that's highlighted here. And um, the red box indicates that's the um, tax line that the incentive will be applied to. So if you're a residential property, you can choose either to have that tax line frozen at the pre-improvement assessment value for 10 years, or you can choose to pay zero on that tax line for the first five years of the incentive. And then for the subsequent five years, um, it'll be 50% of that value. And then this incentive is tied to the property and it's transferable to new owners. So if you complete the rehabilitation process, you receive the tax incentive, and then you decide to sell your home, um, this will be transferable to the new owners. And that's kind of a nice incentive um, for, for buyers as well. There are a few other programs available through the city. So there are city fee waivers for historic rehabilitation. This is a program that is, um, that is coordinated through CCDO, 
which is the city center development and operations department. And so you would apply through CCDO for a city fee waiver and they would reach out to our office. And what we have to determine is if the property is designated or eligible to be designated. So either of those types of properties qualify. And then um, if we determine that the property is eligible for um, designation, or we determine that it is designated already, then it's eligible for 100% waiver of eligible city fees and up to 100% waiver of SAWS fees up to $150,000. So um, this requires our review in the Office of Historic Preservation, whether or not you designate that property. Um, city fee waivers are not um, retroactive. So you can't have fees reimbursed that were already paid. So this is, is important to keep in mind. And also it's, um, it's, the fee waiver program isn't always funded. So this fiscal year, the fee waiver program wasn't funded. So it'd be something to keep in mind if you have a project in mind for the future. And I would check back, you know, in October in the new fiscal year to see if CCDO has funds for this fee waiver program. We also have a uh, tax incentive for new local historic districts. So this is called the local tax exemption for owner occupied residences in new historic districts. And so what this is, is if you are already the owner of a property and your property becomes part of a new historic district um, while you're living there, then you'll automatically receive a 20% exemption for owner occupied properties in new historic districts for 10 years. So this is also a 10 year incentive. Um, there's no additional application that's required. So once your property becomes a part of this new historic district, um, you'll automatically have that uh, incentive applied. So you don't have to submit a separate application through our office. Um, and then long-term occupants may receive an additional five years of the incentive for a total of 15 years. So that means if at the end of the 10 year incentive, you're still residing in that same property, um, you'll be eligible to have that extended for five more years. So it's an incentive for homeowners to stay in their homes in new historic districts. In addition to that, there are San Antonio Conservation Society grants. Um, these are rehabilitation grant funds that are, um, that it, it's a program that's created through NIOSA, so Night in Old San Antonio. And uh, I know everyone's excited for that to start again, hopefully very soon. Um, and this is an annual program that's for residential or commercial structures that are at least 50 years old. Um, so this is a um, application that opens up every year in August. So you can check on August 1st, 2021 to see if that application program is available. And generally that application period lasts until the end of September. Um, so it usually closes by October. So it's a small window of time. So it's another one of those um, programs that if you know you have a project coming up that you might want to think about applying to this if it fits within your time frame. So here, these are the local um, programs that are available for some tax incentives and some other grant programs to help you fund your rehabilitation projects to like increase the longevity of these wonderful historic structures we have here in San Antonio. Um, I do want you to have my information so you can reach out with any questions that you might have. And so our website, www.sapreservation.com. So you can go there for more information about all these tax incentives. And also, like I said, for those incentive applications. And then this phone number is for our main line where there's always a historic preservation specialist on duty. Um, to answer your calls and they can also transfer you to me and then my email address so you can email me directly if you have any questions about the application process and um, if you need to know if your property is eligible for some of these tax incentives um, i think we're going to hold questions till the end um, and then katie can interject if she has any pressing questions she wants to discuss right now um, but I think we're going to move on to Valerie, who's going to discuss the state tax incentives that we have available. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, so everyone, you might need to clear your brain a little bit because we're going to be using a lot of the same words that she was just using, but they're going to start meaning different things when we start talking about state and federal tax credits. But um, it's it's a lot to uh, it's it's a lot to keep track of um, 
and I'm remiss that I put, didn't put our web page on here, but we are the Texas Historical Commission. We're easy to find, and we have a whole section on our web page. If you search for tax credits, we have um, we have a whole page. We have an FAQ. Um, we have a contact us button, and uh, we have all of our applications up there as well. So if you have more questions, you want to do some more research, all of that is on the web uh, at the Texas Historical Commission webpage. Um, so at the Texas Historical Commission, we oversee two separate programs that are interlinked, and they're the state and federal historic rehabilitation tax credit programs. If you could move to the next slide. So the, the federal tax credit program has been around since the 1970s in some form or another and has been in its current form since I think the 1980s. And um, Texas historically has not been a, a huge user of the rehabilitation tax credit program offered by uh, the federal uh, program. And uh, however, you might have heard a lot of buzz more recently about historic tax credits, and that was due to the launch of the state historic preservation tax credit that was launched in 2015. And these two tax credits, one of the big benefits of both of them is that they can pair together on the same project. You can double dip with both of these tax credit programs. Um, so you can do the exact same work on your building, and you can take advantage of both of these tax credits. A lot of the Expectations for both programs are very similar, and the Texas program was designed to mimic the format of the federal so that people could take advantage of both if they are able to do so. So the federal tax credit program is overseen by the National Park Service in coordination with our office. So we are the clearinghouse for all of the applications. We are the people who you will be working with day to day if you're participating in this program. Um, and we then coordinate to the National Park Service. They make all of the final determinations. We're, we work very closely with them on a daily basis on this program. Um, and the state tax credit program is administered solely by us uh, locally at the state level. Um, so the, the big financial benefit of participating in both of them is that the federal tax credit offers 20% back uh, in the form of tax credits. And that's 20% of the investment that you put into the building. Uh, the state tax credit program is worth 25% of the investment that you put into bu the building. And so you could stand to receive 45% total back um, on the amount that you spend on improvements to your building uh, if you participate in both of these programs, which is one of the best financial incentives that is out there for historic preservation. Um, we are going to talk about the eligibility criteria for this program because it's going to be different from what you heard from the, the city of San Antonio, and it's, it's going to differ uh, in a number of criteria of, of eligibility that's going to limit what types of projects are a good fit for these programs. Um, as you can see, they're both rehabilitation programs, and so they are both related to um, expending money to improve a building through a rehabilitation project. <clears throat> you can move to the next slide. All right, we don't need to go through all of these, but there, there are a lot of differences between both of these programs uh, that both of these also will differ from you, what you just heard from the city program as well. So uh, the first one, of course, is that the credit amount is different between the two programs. Um, neither of these credits applies to property taxes. That's a common misconception when we're talking about historic buildings and taxes. Both of these tax credits apply directly to the taxes that uh, the applicant has to pay to the government in some fashion. So for the state tax credit, they, uh, the tax credits counteract state taxes. For the federal program, the credits counteract federal taxes. In that case, the federal income tax. Um, the state tax credit, of course, we don't have state income tax in Texas, um, but the, the taxes that it applies to are two different state taxes. 
And most of our applicants take advantage financially of that setup by selling the tax credits. Um, the tax credits have a value on the open market. Um, so you do not have to use the state tax credits yourself. Um, and if you look at the very bottom, uh, that's what that, uh, that last cell says, that for the state tax credit, credits are freely saleable on the open market. For the federal tax credit, those credits um, are only transferable within the partnership who applies for the tax credit and owns the building. So there are some limitations there as far as who can make use of the credits. Um, we'll get back to that. <laughs> for the for both of the programs, an income producing property would be eligible to participate in the program. So that would be um, any type of commercial property, uh, any type of rental property, things like that. Nonprofits are also eligible to participate directly in the state tax credit program uh, because the applicant does not have to use that tax credit themselves. Nonprofits are not required to pay federal income tax, so therefore they cannot participate directly in the federal credit. There are ways that they can participate by becoming part of a partnership, and um, if that partnership is a for-profit entity, but it can get complicated. Uh, it, it involves lawyers. <laughs> For the state tax credit program, since the credit, uh, the credit certificates are freely transferable, um, that's not an issue, and uh, nonprofits are able to participate directly in the state tax credit program. So, um, one of the things that you are also going to see is that it's not just the the two programs together that are very valuable, but the state tax credit program is also very valuable by itself because it has a greater amount of flexibility. Uh, you'll see in the next line, um, historic designation types that are accepted under both of these programs are slightly different because for the state tax credit program, we can accept federal designation in the National Register of Historic Places. We can also accept um, state designations, which would be a recorded Texas historic landmark or a state antiquities landmark. For the federal program, um, only the National Register is acceptable because that's the federal designation that they're looking for. Um, one of the biggest differences that we see between state and federal for state and federal projects is that um, the minimum project expenditure is very different for both programs. For the state tax credit program, um, the minimum amount that you have to spend on one of these projects in order to qualify and apply for the program is $5,000, regardless of how big your building is and how much it's worth. For the federal tax credit program, typically the minimum that you have to spend is the value of your building. So unlike the, uh, the San Antonio program, where it's 30% of the value of your building, this is going to be 100% of the value of your building. And so not all projects are going to hit that minimum. Um, it depends on the value of your building. It depends on how much money you're going to be expending uh, on that building. The federal program was designed in order to take advantage, uh, excuse me, in order to incentivize people to invest in um, blighted properties and unused, underutilized properties. And so that's why uh, it has that pretty high threshold for participation. Um, let's go to the next slide. We'll see a lot of these themes come back. So for both of these programs, there are two broad program requirements. Number one, the building has to be a certified historic structure. And as you've seen that the definition will differ based on state or federal. Um, and the building must be a certified rehabilitation. So we need to have an eligible property type, it needs to meet the minimum cost threshold, and the work that you're doing to the building needs to meet the secretary's standards for rehabilitation, um, which are the, the standards that are used across the country by uh, local review bodies, including the, uh, including the city of San Antonio as well when they do their reviews. Um, you move to the next slide, please. So um, I already did cover this, but um, one of the things I want to highlight on this page is for the National Register, um, 
it's immaterial to us whether the building is individually listed or whether it contributes to a National Register Historic District uh, that is equivalent for us. Um, additionally, we don't talk about this a lot, but we actually do have one of these in San Antonio and we are looking to have another. Um, when you have a local historic district, there is an opportunity to um, get that district certified by the National Park Service as being um, comparable to a National Register Historic District. And for the purposes of our program, if you go through that process uh, successfully, then that district can now function for your purposes as if it were a National Register Historic District. Um, and of course, only buildings that contribute to the significance of that historic district, whether it's the National Register District or the Certified Local Historic District, um, only the, the contributing properties can uh, apply. Only the contributing properties are considered to be listed in the National Register. Um, and you see below, we have the, the state designations as well. One thing that I do also want to note is that uh, the property does not need to be listed uh, at the time that you apply for the program, the first step in our application process is to confirm that the building is either currently designated or is eligible to become designated. Um, however, the applicant does need to actually pursue and complete the historic designation as part of the process. Uh, for the state program, you are not able to receive the tax credit at the at completion unless that historic designation has officially uh, become realized. So um, let's move to the next slide. Uh, so just a, a quick refresher, your city has probably the best, um, best infrastructure of historic districts that we see in the state of Texas. If you have a building in downtown San Antonio, it is probably in a National Register Historic District. Um, and kudos to the city of San Antonio for listing the downtown and Riverwalk historic district in, I think it went through in 2017. And um, it's, we've seen a huge outpouring of tax credit projects as a result of that. And we see new designations and updated designations from the city of San Antonio every day. So, um, so again, local historic districts are wonderful. You can get them certified. We have certified a local historic district in the city of San Antonio. It's the, uh, the old Rook City Air Force Base uh, in South San Antonio. And uh, uh, yeah, but more people than in other cities are, are already in historic districts in San Antonio. So it's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, if you could move to the next page. Um, Oh, and sorry, on that previous page, uh, apologies, there's a link to that map. Um, you can go online and look at that map yourself. You can, uh, you can see whether you're in a National Register Historic District. Those uh, little green dots are state designations and state markers, and those uh, little blue stars are individual National Register properties. But if you click on those individual items, you can uh, pop up information on that resource and for the historic districts, you can see the, the full district nomination application and typically those have an identity, excuse me, they have a, a list of all of the properties in the district and whether they are considered contributing or non-contributing at the time of listing. Um, so those are really good resources to sort of explore what's going on in historic designations in the city. Now we can move to the next slide, thank you. All right, so generally speaking, how does it work? Um, anyone recognize this building? <laughs> uh, historic designation can be pursued during the project. Both programs, uh, the state and federal, are not competitive, but based on whether the individual applicant qualifies. Uh, there is no deadline. Applications are reviewed on a continuous basis throughout the year. When you're ready to begin your project, then you uh, consult with us and submit your application. Uh, the application process typically starts before the work has begun for similar reasons to uh, what Rachel discussed at the city level. We do have to review all the work that's going to happen. And so therefore it is in the best interest of the applicant to confirm at the front end that the work is going to meet the standards and is going to be able to be approved before uh, the applicant begins investing that money in the building. 
Um, completed projects, unlike for the city of San Antonio, if your work is complete, you are not eligible to participate in either the state or federal tax credit programs. Um, there are some small loopholes, but broadly speaking, that is the case. Um, if your work is halfway done, then you can apply. If your work is almost done, you can probably still apply. But if, if, you, if the work is 100% done, then uh, that project is no longer eligible for participation, unfortunately. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Um, people have a lot of questions about the finances. Credits are awarded to successfully completed projects. Nothing is awarded up front. So the developer, the owner has to carry the costs or secure investments or loans in order to complete the rehabilitation project. And as you might recall, especially for the federal tax credit projects, those can be some, some pretty high dollar projects. And so um, it's, it's something to be aware of that the applicant does need to expend all of the funds uh, in order to complete the project. There's no cap for the tax credits that any project can receive. There's no tax credit. There's no, excuse me, there's no cap for the credits that are issued through the program uh, in any given year or across any uh, number of years of the program. If you apply and you're successful, then you will receive the tax credits. Um, the awarded credit amount is a straight percentage of the eligible cost that you spend. It is all or nothing. You don't get partial credit for um, an okay job. <laughs> you have to complete the project successfully in order to receive the tax credits. Um, the eligible costs, we call them QREs or qualified rehabilitation expenditures. They are defined by what type of cost they are. Um, and that is defined by the internal revenue code. Um, generally, Anything that is a physical improvement to the building uh, is a qualified expenditure. So if that's structure, systems, finishes, as well as most soft costs like architects' fees, uh, engineering costs, et cetera, et cetera. Things that do not count are things that do not improve the value of the historic building. And that includes things like additions, even though you can make an addition and it can be approved as part of a larger project, you don't get money back for that addition um, because it's only about improving the historic building. We have a lot more information about qualified expenditures on our website, and um, we are always happy to discuss the way our program works with callers. So feel free to reach out to us if you have questions about um, how any of this works. Next slide, please. How do we review the projects? Um, we, again, we use the standards for rehabilitation. And as you may or may not know, uh, these standards allow for alterations while prioritizing the historic spaces, materials, and character that remain. So we anticipate as part of these projects, these buildings are going to change. They might receive additions. Um, they might change use. They might, uh, some configurations of the interior spaces might change. Uh, things might be removed or replaced. Uh, our goal is to prioritize the historic components of the building while allowing for as much change as we can within reason. Um, and I, I do want to stop for a second and say that our review, if you're applying for the state or federal tax credit program, our review stands by itself. Um, if you are getting reviewed by, let's say, the Office of Historic Preservation for their tax credit program or uh, just for their permitting process, um, that is not related to our review. So it's very important to ensure that you're pursuing both reviews at the same time because theirs cannot stand in for our review. Uh, uh, let's see. The entire property is going to be reviewed as part of this program, and that's different again from the from the city program. Both interior and exterior work will be reviewed as part of the state and federal tax credit programs. Uh, the current condition of the building is the starting point. When we are talking about a rehabilitation, we can't force you to put back something that's missing that used to be there. Uh, if someone did something really inappropriate to your building, but it still contributes to the district, you're not obligated to take that back out. You can leave it if you want, um, or you can take it out. And in that case, we would want to see something that's compatible with the building. 
Um, all properties are going to be different. So if you saw a building down the street that did something on a tax credit project, doesn't necessarily mean that you can do it. Um, I like to show this image as an example. These are three buildings in downtown Dallas and the right hand building has a rooftop addition. Typically rooftop additions are not approvable on low rise buildings, but since this building is in downtown Dallas and is sandwiched between a bunch of taller buildings, um, you can't see it from a far distance away. Therefore, it's actually not visible from the street level. So in this case, it was permissible, whereas in a lot of other cases, it would not be. So um, just to underscore the importance of coordinating with us and, uh, and realizing that all those buildings are going to be different. There is a lot of guidance on the National Park Service website about how they interpret the standards for rehabilitation as part of the tax credit program as well. But if you have a question about your particular building, the best thing to do is just talk with us. Next slide, please. All right, so examples. What are we, if you're out there and you're seeing your neighbor doing some work on a building or someone is saying, hey, um, I heard about tax credits. Do you think that my project could qualify? Here are the types of things you might be looking out for for projects that could qualify for state and federal. The type of thing that we most typically see for state and federal would be downtown commercial buildings, hotels, office buildings, apartment buildings, rental houses, because remember this can be um, anything that is a commercial use. Uh, industrial adaptive reuse. Uh, we have the Merchants Ice Complex in for review right now in uh, on the east side of San Antonio. So we see a variety of things. One thing that you do not see on here is uh, owner occupied residential, which is again not going to be eligible for either of these programs, unfortunately. Um, and at the bottom again, applying for federal credits typically will require a full building rehabilitation uh, in order to meet that project minimum expenditure, and that's for the federal program. Next slide. For the state tax credit program, um, about two thirds of our projects are state and federal combined, and the remaining one third are state only. And that's for a number of reasons. Number one would be, for instance, a nonprofit building. You see my example here is uh, a church that's St. David's Episcopal in downtown Austin. Uh, so churches are typically incorporated as nonprofits. So as long as you're incorporated as a nonprofit and you have a historic building that you own and operate out of, then that is a perfectly acceptable application of the state tax credit. And it's, you know, it's great because nonprofits typically uh, need all the funding that they can get. Uh, and again, because it has a lower minimum cost threshold, we can see a lot of limited scope projects. So we can see things like individual floors of a building. You know, we're just finishing out this floor now. We might do some more later. Uh, so we'll just apply for a state uh, tax credit. Exterior only or interior only improvements, um, roof or window work, structural repair. We've seen some projects like that. Um, also, some of those big ticket items that are not romantic, but they're, you know, they're necessary for the ongoing use of the building, like systems upgrades. We see a lot of HVAC improvements, fire suppression, elevator work, all of the above. Um, and so again, state tax credit, it has a $5,000 minimum. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that it'll be worth your while to apply for the program if you're spending only $5,000, but, um, it just means that it's it's really very open as far as the project size that can potentially fit into the state tax credit program. Next slide. Um, now I've got some examples. Here we have a San Antonio project. This is a residential building type, but it's currently used as an architect's office. So this is the LT Wright House. This is in the south end of San Antonio, constructed in 1917, and it's individually listed for its significant architectural style uh, designed after the prairie style dwellings uh, from Frank Lloyd Wright. And what they did was they replaced the cedar roof and they put on brand new copper gutters. And I'm not gonna give you the project total, but it's that's a very expensive improvement to that building. That was the historic roof type, uh, and it's very expensive to do it properly. 
but um, it, it was a fantastic use of the state tax credit program. And that was the only one that they participated in. Um, that project was certified in 2016. Uh, next slide, please. And here as a counter example, but also as a residential property, this is a small cottage that contributes to a historic district in Houston built around uh, 1900. And this was rehabilitated for use as a residential rental property. So it is just a rental house. Um, they did a full soup to nuts rehabilitation of this building. As you can see on the left hand side, it was in very poor repair. Um, it needed just about everything. It needed all new systems. Um, it needed structural work. Uh, we're going to see some more images in the next slide. Uh, thank you. So this was, since this was a full rehabilitation, it did qualify for both the state and federal tax credit programs, and they participated participated in both simultaneously. You can see one of the things that they did was they reconstructed the historic front porch that had been lost, and that was based on the, the footprint that they found when researching on historic Sanborn maps. Uh, they were permitted to add a new rear deck on the back uh, because it has limited visibility back there. You can see some other alterations they made on the exterior, like shortening that window that is in a bathroom. They put in a new kitchen in the existing space and they refinished the floors. They did a whole lot of work to a very small house, um, but it all qualified towards the tax credit program. Next slide, please. All right, and so last but not least, just some takeaways. These programs are voluntary, so um, no one is obligated to go through these processes, uh, but we are here to support anyone who applies and help them understand the program requirements and whether their project is going to work and help guide them through the process in a way that's going to be successful for them. Um, some projects, again, are going to be a better fit than others. Um, not every project is a, a perfect fit for these programs, but for the projects that can take advantage of these programs, they're a, a fantastic resource. Um, and again, coordinate with us early, coordinate with us often, even if you're not sure if you have a tax credit project, just give us a call. <laughs> we'll chat with you, we'll figure it out. Um, and with that, I guess we'll wait on questions for me as well. Is that true? Uh, all right, well, thank you everyone. I will uh, hand you over to Ellis. She's gonna give you some examples of successful tax credit projects in San Antonio. Hey y'all, uh, happy to be with you. I have the fun job of, of using some example projects to show you. So, like I said, I'm with a preservation consulting firm called Post Oak Preservation Solutions. And what we do is we work with the whole project team um, to get us all on board to find a project that meets both the standards that Valerie and the reviewers at the Park Service are going to approve while also meeting the programmatic needs of the applicant. So depending on what the property owner, what the developer has in mind, we need to be able to, to mash those together to find a result that makes us happy, uh, makes everyone happy, I should say. So we work with the client, we work with the architect and everyone else involved, the MEP engineer, structural engineer, interior designer, all of it. Uh, so I'm going to use some completed projects in San Antonio, as well as some in progress projects to show you how we approach them um, and sort of what our mindset is for them. So let's go to the next slide. Please. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with some completed projects and we can just zip right on through to the next next slide, please. All right, so here is a before photo of the Burns building. This is here in San Antonio and. So, like I said, we're going to use these projects as some examples of some particular types of work um, that we do and, and some of our thought process. So the Burns building here was built in two phases. It's pretty clear. It's got this fifth floor, which I use the very technical term of a little hat. It's got a little hat on top um, and that was added in the 50s. And one of the things that the client wanted with this building was to get some more windows on the top floor. So if you look at the windows that are existing in before, 
um, you see we've got these sets of three windows on either side, and those nicely align with the windows beneath them. And then we've got this sort of random smattering of windows in between, um, not following much of a pattern. So let's go to the next slide and we'll see what we did. So in order to get windows in, uh, we added those in the fifth floor, but we aligned those with the window openings below. And that way they look like they fit in. Um, it's, it's not, it doesn't stand out visually when you look at the building. It sort of looks like, okay, this makes sense. What is key um, and what is one of the standards is that we don't create uh, a false sense of history. So we don't do anything fake old. Um, and so in this case, you can see that the window configuration, so the way that the Munton grid shows up on the windows, is different on the windows on the fifth floor compared to the one over one hung windows that we see on floors three through four. And that's so that, you know, the, the one over one windows would not be an appropriate choice in that 1950s um, edition on the top. And the other thing I'll point out on this elevation, and we'll see it on the interior, is that the side, this is the side elevation that originally did not have an entrance. And one of the goals was to add another entrance in. So historically, this was a department store with offices, and we basically kept that use of ground floor retail offices above, but they wanted a separate office entrance on this side. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so they needed to create a new lobby to create that entrance. This is the before picture of what the new lobby looked like. So you can see it's a pretty utilitarian space. We've got a two-story volume in the middle and then a mezzanine inserted um, to create a, a second floor. We've got these structural columns that are visible. Um, and if you can, it's difficult to tell here, but at the top of those columns, there's a little ornamental detail. And so when Valerie was talking about how it's reviewed and how the tax credit project allows for change as long as these significant features are retained on the interior of a building like this, we're looking at the volume and the configuration of the space and we're looking at some of those architectural details like the column capital. So let's go to the next slide to see uh, what we accomplished here to create the lobby. So this is the same space um, and they just dressed it up a bit. So you can see that the configuration is the same. We retain this two story volume with a mezzanine around it. Uh, they enclosed part of the mezzanine you see on the left, but you can see that that enclosure is held back from the edge so that that original shape of the mezzanine is still visible. Um, they updated a lot of the finishes and the railings, as you can see. Uh, the railings that were in there in the before picture were not original anyway. Um, we often run into issues with original railings not being code compliant, so then we have to um, augment those. But in this case, they were able to come in with new code compliant railings and other details like that paneling that are compatible with the character of the building. And it's a little bit easier to see now that they're painted white, but at the top of the columns there, you can see that little ornament at the Capitol. And so that was retained. And then let's take a look at the next slide to see the upper floors. So big wide open space, great opportunity for open office space, which is what the applicants decided to do. Here's our before picture. So you see it's essentially a blank slate. Uh, not a lot needed to be done here to turn this into an open uh, office space. But what I want you to notice in this picture is the huge ducts. So there's great big HVAC ducts and they were, there's three of them that run the length of this space. So right there in the middle and then to the right of the photo, you can see one. And then there is one actually off screen to the left. And so let's go to the next slide to see how we, we solved that. So we were able to change out the HVAC system to remove those great big ducts. So just like you know, Valerie mentioned the project that just updated that you can update HVAC and it's not, you know, it's not fancy, it's not really exciting, but it can make a huge difference. So in this project, they replaced a more traditional HVAC system with a VRF system, which we don't need to go into the details of how it works, but essentially what it means is that we don't have to have great big ducts. And instead we get to use just these ceiling mounted units that are pretty low profile. So you can see one mounted on the ceiling 
um, to the right of center at the pic in the picture. And so it creates a much more open space uh, in the office. A couple other things to point out here. Um, they retained the historic open character. So it's one of those character defining features of this building, this open interior, the visible columns. But of course, they wanted some offices and conference rooms. So they built those on the left side of this photo towards the rear of the space, not blocking any windows. So again, you go upstairs, you still feel this big open space, but functionally, we've got some meeting rooms. The last thing I'll point out on this building are these great contemporary light fixtures. So, you know, these projects do not have to be restoration projects. We have an opportunity to introduce some contemporary fixtures and finishes. And in this case, it's these great linear light fixtures that are still compatible with the character of the building. So we can, we can walk that line, find a balance that gets the look that we want uh, while still being approvable. So let's move on to the next slide and the next example project. So now we'll talk about the Lockwood Bank, um, which is now Maverick Whiskey. This is an example of a smaller commercial type project. And from the exterior, not a lot needed to change. It's really in pretty good shape. It functioned how they needed, but they really just needed to clean up the exterior. So I want you to look at this before picture and especially look at the top that the parapet and you can see there's graffiti and there's masonry staining. Um, so let's look at the next photo to see what we are able to accomplish there. So here we see this beautiful, clean bank building. Uh, so they cleaned the masonry in a way that did not damage or abrade or stain the stone while still removing any of that bio growth, any of that graffiti. Uh, it is imperative and part of your planning process to figure out a cleaning methodology and a repair methodology for your masonry that isn't gonna damage it, that is gonna be appropriate. So in this case, you know, we make recommendations um, and you test that methodology to be sure it's going to work before you use it on the whole building. Uh, let's go to the next slide because the interior is a bit more dramatic on this one. All right, so here's the interior of the bank. Um, and as banks go, it's actually pretty simple, um, not super fancy on the interior. What I want you to notice here, however, is that this, like the Burns building actually, is a combination of a two story volume and then with a mezzanine inserted. And this ended up being a great configuration for the new use as a distillery. So when we're talking about finding an appropriate building for your proposed use, this was a great uh, pairing. So again, we've got this two-story volume that the person taking this picture is standing in, and then this inserted mezzanine. And let's take a look at the next slide. So here is how they used the space underneath the mezzanine. So that became sort of your entry situation. And then you can see to the left where the actual distilling is happening. And we'll see, we'll see in another photo where the tanks utilized that two-story space. Another thing I'll point out uh, that is a great example in this project is the use of compatible finishes. So finishes that are in keeping with the character of the building. In this case, we've got terrazzo floors. Um, Elsewhere in the building, we'll see mosaic tile. Uh, the other thing that was clever about this project is that they, they used the existing structural beams, which you could see in the before photo, and they just furred out those beams. So they, they created a sort of drywall soffit around the beams, and that allowed space for all of the systems to be obscured. So the ductwork, the uh, electrical conduit, the plumbing, all of that gets to be hidden in the soffits doesn't need to be visible. Because in this case, the bank being a historically finished space, we would want to minimize any exposed systems. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so here's another before photo. We're up on top of the mezzanine. And so in this photo, you can see the mezzanine here with the railing and beyond the railing is the two story volume that we saw from below the mezzanine previously. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so here's how they used that space. They used the mezzanine as a bar. And then if you look right at the center of the photo, you'll see the stills and the tanks for the whiskey distillery. So like I said, this was 
a really good building for this use. It had the vertical space for the distilling uh, process while having these kind of cozy spots to create this nice bar space. Uh, again, they're using compatible finishes. So the floors here are mosaic tile, which is perfect for this time period. Again, building soffits down around the existing structural beams. Uh, according to Texas state law, you have to have a physical barrier between alcohol sales and alcohol production. And so in this case, they built this wall that lines the mezzanine, but they put great big windows in the wall. And that way you still retain the visibility and you can still figure out what the original configuration is while you know, abiding by state law, which would be an important part of making this project successful. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but here's a handful of projects in San Antonio that have been completed in the past few years. And they really show the wide range of uses and sizes and types of buildings. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of these that, that may be relevant to y'all listening. So the second one on the list here is uh, the Maverick Carter House. And so that's an example of a single family home. Um, and that was renovated to become an event center. So a new income producing use that was finished a few years ago. Uh, let's see, then we've got two mid-century resources on this list. So we've got the El Tropicano Riverwalk Hotel. And at the very bottom, we've got the Wedgwood. So El Trop is in process right now. Wedgwood was completed last year. And I wanted to highlight those because sometimes we get it in our minds that the only historic buildings are 1920s and older or something like that. But again and again, we're working on a lot more mid-century modern resources, which, which bring their whole other uh, bevy of challenges, uh, which we'll talk about in one of the other example projects that we'll bring up. But it's important to keep in mind, we've, we've got a diversity of, of building ages. And the last one I'll highlight on this list, and you can feel free to Google some of these later, is Jefferson High School. And Jefferson High School is a great example of a project that utilized just the state credit because it is not income producing, because it's a public high school. So San Antonio Independent School District has been able to secure and then sell the state tax credit in order to fund a couple of different renovation projects at Jefferson High School. So they've done the gymnasium, um, the cafeteria is wrapping up and then there'll be another phase as well. And if I recall correctly, Jefferson High School was the first example of a public school doing this in Texas. And so we might see that happening um, again and again. It's a, you need a lawyer for it is, is the short answer for it, but it's doable. So let's move on to the next slide. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about just two projects um, that are in process. And I wanted to bring these up just because I know that people like to see the behind the scenes um, and get the know-how, but also I wanted to show you our thought process when we approach different buildings. Like Valerie said in her presentation, uh, every building is different. And so the standards get applied differently, not because of inconsistency, but because the buildings have different character defining features. So every building we have to identify what those are and also the use is different. Uh, depending on the client. And so we have to figure out how those all work together. So let's move to the next slide, talk about our first example. All right, so the first example I'm gonna bring up is one of my favorites uh, and that's in process right now. And this is Billy Mitchell Village. Billy Mitchell Village is an apartment complex completed in 1949 out at Port San Antonio. Uh, it's a complex of 23 apartment buildings. Um, there were other apartment buildings added in various phases later, but Billy Mitchell Village is, is the heart of it here. Uh, it was built after World War II for Kelly and Lackland Air Force Base and Listees, and at the time it was the largest military housing project. Um, so it's great, it's exciting, um, and it has challenges. So the three big challenges here, first, varying condition of buildings. So like I said, there's 23 buildings here. Um, it's been occupied for much of this time, but some of the buildings have been vacant and that has meant there have been actually several different fires that have happened. And so that has left some buildings in really poor condition, some damaged and one burned all the way to the ground several years ago. But the advantage is that the, while each building is slightly different, 
they all use uh, decorative features from basically a menu of choices. And so that means we're able to replicate um, any missing historic features that were damaged or destroyed by fire. Um, and then speaking of decorative elements, uh, as often happens with buildings like this, there is a combination of actual historic and faux historic decorative elements. And so one of the big challenges that we had initially examining this site along with the architects was determining what's original and what's fake old. So looking at this photo, we see shutters. Those are not original. Um, and so we'll be, uh, as part of this project, those will be removed. And, and other things, there are balconies. Some of the balconies are original. Most of them are not. And other things, they wrapped columns, they changed the shapes of them. So we've had to do a lot of investigation. And the last big, the, probably the biggest challenge here are the windows. Uh, and we will go into detail on that. Let's go to the next slide. We'll look at some more photos of this project. So here's a typical building. The buildings range in size. Um, so you see this one has three entrances. Sometimes they only have one entrance. So you can see it's about a third the size of this. Um, another challenge that's unique about these mid-century buildings is some of the materials. So in this case, the upper floor is clad in asbestos tile. And contrary maybe to popular belief, asbestos tile is safe as long as it's in good condition. However, there are some cases where it is damaged or deteriorated, and so we need to replace it. Um, the great thing is there is a cementitious wall tile, so like hardy plank, hardy, plank, hardy board, um, that can match that asbestos profile exactly. This photo also shows our non-historic balconies that we've had to figure out were not original. Um, let's go to the next slide. So some typical interiors, um, all of these apartments have I mean, I love a 1940s, 1950s bathroom. So here's a great example here on the left. Um, there's sort of a palette of pastel tiles that you see um, smattered about the apartment units and apparently no rhyme or reason as far as I can tell. This one's pink, that one's green, this one's blue, that one's yellow. Um, you know, I think it was just based on the mood that day, what they went with. Um, and then here's our typical stairwell, you know, pretty simple utilitarian uh, type of building. Let's go to the next slide. Um, here's an interior typical bedroom. Uh, so in this case, we've got wood floors and just, you know, not a ton of ornament, not really elaborate base trim. There is wood base trim and it's a pretty simple work from this point. We keep the finishes, we repair it. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, windows. So like I said, windows were a big issue on this project. They're a big issue on many projects. Um, we had kind of two scopes of work that we needed to do. First, just repair the existing windows. And there's their steel casement windows, casement meaning they, they pivot open, they, or the hinge open, I should say. Um, so this photo shows you the original window at the top and another original window at the bottom, but that's been restored. And in this case, it's working with a skilled and experienced window restoration company. They remove the window, take it off site, repair it and then bring it back. And in this case, because uh, it's such a big project, um, we were able to work with a windows restorer who is then training uh, new folks who are on site to how to do this restoration. So it's a windows um, co restoration company out of Austin. He comes down to San Antonio, trains the crew how to do it, and then they are able to work on it locally. So it becomes this kind of great job training program. Let's move to the next slide. This does not look exciting. This is the most exciting thing. This has been like the highlight of my year was figuring out this solution. So I'll try to explain it in a way that makes you feel the excitement that I feel about this. So on the left, we're showing an original window and that has been removed. Uh, so like I said, these are original steel casement windows. And what a casement window means is that it opens like doors basically. So you see it's got hinges on either side and then it latches in the center and that vertical piece is called a mullion. So it's the vertical mullion that the window closes into. By code, all of the bedrooms need to have one window that you can climb out of in the case of a fire. You can't fit out that window. So what are we gonna do? We couldn't find a good replacement that would match the profile and these don't need replacement based on um, condition anyway, they were in great shape. So the team figured out this genius solution. 
and that is to turn what was a paired casement window, so two operable sashes, into a single casement window, so one great big sash that hinges open. So in order to do that, they welded the operable sashes to the center mullion and then cut the mullion off at the top and then it just hinges from one side and that way it's easy to operate uh, and someone could climb out in the case of an emergency so this was this is just like the biggest revelation really thrilling um, we get to keep the windows while of course you know we can't overlook life safety historic windows don't trump life safety but this way we were able to keep both of them let's move to the next slide please Here's another great project. So this one is, is new. It's not as, as far along as Billy Mitchell. This is Plaza Hotel slash Granada Homes. It's on the Riverwalk at Mary Street. Um, it was built 1927 to 29 by heirs and heirs. It was a Hilton by the 50s. And then in 1966, it was converted to Granada Homes Apartments, which is affordable senior housing. It will retain that affordable senior housing use after renovation. Uh, this is a very fancy building, to, to put it simply. It has two ballrooms, it has ground floor retail, and just a tremendous lobby. And I'll show you pictures of the interior. Challenges here are all of these changes that have happened over time that have covered up a lot of historic finishes. Another challenge, which is very technical, is that this project is not only getting state and federal historic tax credits, but it's also getting low income housing tax credits, which comes with its own package of requirements in terms of unit size and amenities uh, and all sorts of things like that. So we have to navigate both of those. And finally, like I said, it's just very fancy. And so that means there's a lot of important what I call high style interior spaces that we need to pay careful attention to. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Here's your overall exterior. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great big building. Um, all of the windows have been replaced, so they're non-historic. At the ground floor, you see that arcade, that series of arches. Those used to be windows. Those have been infilled. Let's move to the next slide. Here's the lobby, which, like I said, is incredible. And it's a great example of, I would will say, unfortunate. The kind word is unfortunate non-historic finishes. So at the left, you see this beautiful vaulted ceiling, and then just beyond it, there's dropped lay-in grid ceiling. And so above that lay-in grid ceiling is more vaulted ceiling that goes all the way across. So one of our goals would be to uncover and restore that vaulted ceiling. You see this beautiful uh, tile floor throughout. At the right, you see wood paneling, and that paneling wraps the columns and those columns have more incredible tile on them. So uh, we'll get to take off that paneling, which is at uh, 80s or 90s, take that off, restore the tile beneath. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Here is one of two ballrooms. Uh, this ballroom is generally in pretty good shape. It's got beautiful terrazzo floors. The issue here is how they inserted HVAC and uh, sprinkler lines. So you can see these big sprinkler lines hanging down this great big soffit. And you could, you probably could have accomplished this a little bit better, but they really just blasted through the decorative plaster. So a lot of the ornament was lost, but otherwise this is in pretty good shape. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, here's the vending machines. Um, this is a historic dining room and you can see these hints of beautiful tile wainscot. Um, that would have wrapped the whole room. We have historic photos. And then the ceiling above this dropped ceiling was coffered originally. So we haven't been able to do a full assessment of what the condition of that ceiling is, but it seems like it's at least partially there. So a really ornamental plaster ceiling. So we'll get to uncover that, see if there's any tile left um, hidden in the walls as well. So these are, these are the big challenges with this one. There's so much hidden stuff. Um, so much investigation that has to be done, and it's a, it's a really big building, so we have to just keep poking and prodding. Let's move on to the next slide. This is the other ballroom. This is the top floor ballroom. Incredible panoramic views of the entire city of San Antonio. Fortunately, this one has not seen uh, a ton of changes, uh, so there's not a lot for us to do in here. Let's move on to the next slide. Here's your typical apartment. So, you know, this was originally hotels. A hotel and then it became apartments in 1966 and when they did that they just combined hotel rooms so every apartment is really just two hotel rooms and 
one of the bathrooms would become a kitchen. So what we're looking at here is the bathroom that became a kitchen. And then the other hotel room, which is interconnected, retains that original bathroom. Uh, so not a ton of work to do here. Uh, we'll just be updating the kitchen, basically. Let's move on to the next slide. Here's the bathroom. Okay, so I've shown you two bathroom shots. So I guess I really like bathroom fixtures and tiles, but this retains wonderful floor tile and wall tile. Another thing, you know, issue with this building challenge is the varying conditions. So some of them, like this one, retain all this historic tile. Some only have part. Some have their historic toilet tub and sink. Some only have one of those. So working with the architect, we came up basically with a tiered approach to the bathroom. So depending on their integrity, depending on what was left in the building, um, we took a different approach. And let's move on to the next slide. That's our final slide. So keys to a successful project, and this would apply to all of these tax incentives, I think. Um, decide if you can early on if you're going to go for tax credits, because that's going to affect the decisions that you make. It will help you if you decide early to be careful in your planning before you make design decisions. What we don't want to have happen is, is have a really like, oh, this is what it's going to look like. This is my vision. Have your architect draw it up go before HDRC or bring it to the state and they say no. <laughs> and then we got to start over again. So plan early. Um, historic research, so uh, historic photographs, historic maps, architectural drawings are the holy grail. We don't get those uh, with all of our projects. That's going to help you know what's appropriate. In Granada, as an example, important to investigate behind, above, beneath non-historic finishes and features. Poke up your ceiling tiles, rip up the rugs, see what's underneath. And the last two are really, I would argue, the most important. Have a creative and solution-oriented team. Have people who are willing to, to debate and have conversation and come up with new ideas that, that get us where we want to go. Be willing to be flexible and have some patience. So that's that's the end of my talk. I think um, we can. I know I breezed through that, so we can take questions, um, which I think Katie will uh, facilitate for us. Um, yes, I will. And thank you, all, all three of you. That was amazing. Um, I learned a lot <laughs> that I didn't know, um, specifically about the state and federal credits. Um, that's a lot to navigate. You guys are amazing. <laughs> I just wanted to pop in real quick. I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Uh, if you like looking at pictures of historic tax credit projects, we have, um, we're trying to come up to date with these, but we have all of our projects up through um, 2018 and half of 2019 uh, certified projects on the web. And each of the projects has a project summary and um, a photo gallery and descriptions of the work that happened as part of that project. And they're all keyed to a map that is interactive of the state of Texas. So you can zoom in and explore those to your heart's content. Awesome. Thanks for that, Valerie. Um, and first of all, I don't think I introduced myself at the beginning. My name is Katie Totman. I work for the Office of Historic Preservation with Rachel. And um, just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, so on to questions. Um, so these are for the local level. Um, Rachel, what do most folks tend to choose? The 10 year or the five year? Um, five, uh, five zero, five fifty. Yes, that's a great question. And we get that all the time from our applicants. Um, they want to know what's going to work best for them. And it really just depends. It depends on how they in tend to um, use the tax credit if they're going to stay in their home, if they're looking to sell, um, you know, what their actual property tax bill looks like. Um, so I highly recommend doing that map, trying to figure out which incentive will work best for you and your property. Um, I will say um, a lot of the applicants that we have who do intend to sell their home sometimes choose the 50550 option because they're going to get that tax um, tax line at zero for the first five years and then the subsequent five years will be assessed at 50% of the post rehabilitation appraisal. Um, but uh, it also depends on if you have other tax exemptions on your property already. So I really think that it's something to look at on a case by case basis. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, let's see. The next one is um, if you have a casita that is being rented, would this qualify as income producing? I think this would go to um, either Valerie or Ellis. I can take that. Um, yes, if you if you have a rental property that counts as income producing, um, you know my concern with a casita is that the scope of work that you do may not qualify for federal. It might be so small, um, but if you're spending at least five thousand, that could be a good fit for um, the state credit. And we've worked on sort of Airbnb type rentals before too for this for the tax credit, and that can work. Perfect. Um, the next one is, um, does the new local historic district incentive um, apply for someone who purchases the home within the 10 years of it being designated historic? Unfortunately, it does not. So the purpose really of the um, the tax exemption for owner occupied residences in new historic districts is that it's an incentive for the property owner at the time of designation. Um, and then the incentive uh, adds the potential five years at the end of the first 10 year incentive as an incentive for property owners to stay in those homes. Um, so if you purchase your property after it's already been designated, you would not be eligible for that tax incentive. That one is not transferable to new property owners. Okay, perfect. Um, the next one is, um, so the, the question is, so the comment was, everything I have researched that is applicable for these tax credits imply that the property must be income producing or must be a designated historic structure at the state or federal level. Um, so they weren't sure if they were eligible, eligible for the credits, but I think we've we've kind of answered that. But if um, if y'all want to touch on it just quickly again, um, the I guess the qualifications for the state or federal credits. Sure. So um, for for the federal tax credit program, yes, generally you have to be an income producing use. Uh, what what was the other half of the question? It was about being a historic building. Um, yes, you so have to be a historic building. <laughs> That's why it's a historic tax credit program. Um, yeah, must must be designated um, historic. It has to be designated. Local. If it's not designated already and it's eligible to become designated, you can get it designated. That can be all part of the process. People who are doing that um, run the two processes side by side. So while they're participating in the architectural component of the process, they're also pursuing the necessary historic designation. And that's completely fine that they're running, they're tracking together um, if the building is not already designated. But it does have to be eligible. Uh, that's the first thing we check. You can't get, you know, all the way to, you know, halfway to home plate and, and find out that your building's not eligible. That would be, um, that's not how it happens. Um, for the state tax credit program, um, income producing properties are eligible as well as nonprofit use properties. Um, and when Ellis was bringing up the uh, the active high school project, the way that they um, participated was that there is a nonprofit arm. This is my basic understanding of what they set up. There's a nonprofit entity that is the entity that is applying to and doing the work as part of the tax credit program. And so that's that's how they um, are involved in the tax credit program as as a nonprofit entity. Okay, perfect. That was I think that answered the question perfectly. Um, let's see, we've got the next question is, um, is there a way for and, and if this is for the at the local level, um, Rachel? Is there a way for an individual who is not taxed, for example, if um, an individual is over 65 or a disabled vet, can they still utilize the incentives? 
That's a great question. And we have wonderful partners at the Bear County Appraisal District. Um, we work with Marquesa Esparza quite frequently, and she's absolutely fantastic. And I would recommend reaching out to the Bear County Appraisal District to see if there's a way that they could apply something to the property um, if it's already at 100% exemption. Um, so that's what that would be my, be rec my recommendation would be to reach out to BCAD and to see if there are options available. And they're really great at working with property owners. Um, so our office is really determining the eligibility for this tax incentive and passing that along to the Bear County Appraisal District and they apply the property tax incentive. So they would be um, the best uh, body to reach out to for that. Okay, perfect. Um, just a couple more. Um, let's see if a, and this is not, maybe not so much for the tax incentive, but somebody had a question about um, I think probably just general review, like if a building has a state or national or federal designation, um, what the review process would be if they're making any kind of modifications. Sure. Um, so that depends on on what type of designation the property has. Uh, generally speaking, being in the National Register of Historic Places or being a, a contributing property uh, does not trigger any uh, review at the federal or state level um, unless federal funds are involved, which is uh, referred to as the section 106 process, which is a, it's a required consultation process that involves, um, if federal funding is involved in an undertaking, whether that's the Department of Transportation or HUD or anything like that, um, there needs to be an assessment of how it affects historic resources, but that does not involve most projects. That involves a very small amount of projects. Um, so National Register, I like to think of it as like the closer the locus of control is to you, the more control they have over you. So if you are in a city of San Antonio listed historic district, or if you're a city landmark, they have review over what you do to your property um, and you're obligated to participate in that review. Um, if you go up to the federal level, they generally don't have review over what you're doing to your particular property, um, but you would be eligible for things like uh, financial incentives. At the state level, the two types of state designation have different obligations. Um, state antiquities landmarks, which are generally um, public properties, um, that would include things like the, the missions, uh, very significant properties in the state of Texas. Um, most of our courthouses are state antiquities, landmarks, that kind of property. Um, they are obligated to submit applications to our office, not to me uh, and my team, but to a separate team in our office to have those, have any proposed work reviewed. Um, recorded Texas historic landmarks are a lesser designation. Um, and we have many more of them. Um, the recorded Texas historic landmarks require a notification process. If an applicant, well, if, if a property owner owns a recorded Texas historic landmark, they are obligated to notify our office 60 days in advance of doing any work that affects the exterior of the building um, and the property. So, um, that's just a notification requirement, and then we have the opportunity to comment, but we cannot stop you from doing work to a recorded Texas historic landmark um, as long as you have notified us in advance. And again, that only affects exterior work. It does not affect interior work. So um, as you can see, these are in sort of decreasing, <laughs> decreasing order. Um, however, just to note, that participation in the state tax credit program does not require you to get a state designation. You can receive um, a national register designation and that is perfectly acceptable for both programs, state and or federal. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question is, how can I find out if the incentive is on a property being purchased? And I guess this can be for both the local and, and the, um, state and federal? Uh, sure, for the local level, you can absolutely call our office at any time or send us an email and we can uh, look in our records and see if there is currently a local tax incentive on your property. I guess I'll I don't think the question is really, 
pertinent yeah. to our programs, <laughs> do you think? Alex? Yeah, I was just going to clarify. So, you know, the local incentives, uh, as Rachel described, live with the property, um, but the state and federal live with the entity. So, um, the, the company that gets the credit. So, mm -hmm. all you would be looking for from a state and federal level is if your building is listed on the national register and therefore it might be eligible um, for these other programs. But there wouldn't be any state or federal incentive that stays with the property. Right. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I did have somebody did ask um, about the uh, the steel casement windows um, about who possibly did the restoration or if if there was a way they could get that information. <laughs> yeah, I'll share that. So um, the company that is facilitating that is Red River Restorations. They're out of um, Austin. They do excellent work. Um, they're just a small firm, and so for for this project to build the capacity. Uh, they had to train up a bunch of folks here in San Antonio. I believe those are that's also the company that did the restoration of the wood windows on the Capitol building in Austin. So they are um, they're a note firm. I will say that as a state agency, I cannot say anything else, but they they have done a lot of significant projects. Very cool. I did not know they did um, steel casement window restoration. That's fantastic. Um, we have a lot of questions about who does that here in town, which I don't think there's many people in San Antonio. So that's a good resource to have. Um, and this is for the local level. Um, do local historic tax credits need to be renewed each year or do they occur automatically? Oh, that's such a great question. So I'm glad that was asked. Um, so once you've qualified for the substantial rehabilitation tax incentive through our office, and we send your information to the Bear County Appraisal District the following year, the Bear County Appraisal District will send an application form to the property every year for 10 years. So you'll receive that form around the same time in the spring each year, and you'll fill that out and return that to BCAD within 30 days, and then they'll reapply the incentive to your property taxes that year. Perfect. Okay, two more. Um, would the tax incentive include or extend to rehabbing of a detached structure on the property, um, such as a garage or a garage apartment? Yes, yeah, so or I think. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know. If that's I guess maybe for any of the above. Y yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I sorry. Um, I I think we kind of already covered that with the casita. Yes, we do review um, outbuilding improvements if that outbuilding is a historic building. Um, so if you have a historic house and you have uh, an outbuilding, that doesn't necessarily mean that that outbuilding is eligible for tax credits unless that outbuilding is also uh, contributing to the significance of that historic property or district. Um, if it's within the period of significance, if it is a historic building and it has not been significantly altered, it likely would contribute, um, in which case it would be uh, an opportunity to participate in a, a tax credit uh, program for that building. Awesome. And yes, um, so for local tax credits that would qualify, um, that would that can be used to meet that 30% threshold of the home site improvement value that's uh, required. And that would be any scope of work that extends the life of that accessory structure. Um, so it's all, any rehabilitation work that occurs on the property. So that'll include outbuildings and garages and casitas as well. Perfect. And then one last question. I think um, I may know the answer, but I will leave it to the experts. Um, the question is, what if you live in the main house and rent out the casita? This is back to the casita question about um, using that as a rental property. Um, and so would that would that qualify for the the state and federal credits? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I would just recommend it's uh, to be sure it's very clear that you're it's income producing for renting out that casita, which of course it is if you're renting it, but just that you can show that you're making income from it. Um, but that should be okay. Awesome. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that there 
there is a provision for buildings that are partially owner occupied. Um, this comes up a lot when we're talking about like a bed and breakfast, like a traditional bed and breakfast that part of it is the owner's suite and the majority of it is income producing. Um, and my general understanding, since I'm not on the financial end, but my general understanding of the guidance that I give people is that um, the, uh, if it's one building, the income producing portion has to be at least 50% of the square footage. And um, if you are doing work on the whole building, then your qualified expenditures would be prorated based on the percentage of the building that is income producing. So basically you can do it. You just don't get any credit for the portion uh, that is not income producing the, the portion that is owner occupied. Perfect. Well, it looks like that wraps up the questions. I don't see any more in the queue. Um, so I think that um, with that, um, we can wrap this up. Um, thank you again, everybody. This was amazing. Um, and I did want to share with um, everybody our next um, our next speaker series um, event is going to be happening on April 22nd. And we'll be talking about paint analysis and more information will go out um, early next week. We'll send out an email to everyone who registered with a link to the video. Um, we can probably also include the presentation itself and a survey um, to fill out and let us know how we did. Um, and then information about how to register for the event in April. So if there are no more questions, um, I guess we will wrap it up and say goodnight. <laughs> so thank you everybody and we will talk to you soon.